Hey guys, Dasslender Magic here, and today we get to peek behind the curtain of uh, MTG Arena with the absolute top level management of it, I guess. I didn't think either of these people were involved in it, to be honest, but uh, this is an interview with uh, Aaron Forsyth and Chris Clay. So, Aaron Forsyth, I'm familiar with. Um, if I were to name the top five most hated people at Wizards of the Coast, for me personally, all five of them would be Aaron. Just kidding, he's number two. And Mark Rosewater is number three. Have fun trying to guess number one. I'm not even going to say their name because they would lose their shit. They are a sensitive little snowflake bitch. Anyway, Aaron is famous for um, being, I, I guess, in charge of like, like card design, play testing, and like R&D. So basically making sure stuff isn't broken and standard isn't broken. So how he still has a job nine bands in, uh, I don't know. Also, he's famous amongst the other uh, staff members at Wizards for saying literally anything on Twitter and just making a complete ass out of himself. He is famously responsible for allowing Coco, collected company, into the game and then later in an interview saying, it was the number one card I was most surprised by. I thought it would just be a gimmick used in some uh, sealed and draft environments. Never did I think that it would become popular in modern, let alone standard, and it broke standard for like a year and a half. Getting two creatures out for free, he didn't think that would be popular in standard or modern. It's a $23 card right now. How and why do you still have a job, Aaron Forsyth? As for Chris Clay, um, I legit don't remember who he is. Hopefully it says in the interview. So it starts with an intro by Aaron Forsyth, and of course I'm going to uh, read it a bit and uh, add my commentary to it, as usual. And they said reaction videos were dead. So it starts out with uh, Aaron saying, Hello gamers! Exclamation mark. How dare you, Aaron? Aaron, my last name sounds like a plant, Forsyth. How dare you assume my gender? <laughs> Wait, I mean, assume that I'm a gamer. I mean, I am, but you can't just go around assuming things. I bet it's because I'm a white man and I like Doritos. He's just jumping to conclusions. You know what, Aaron? I heard a rumor on the internet that you're not a real gamer grill. So I'm going to go cook my gamer burgers somewhere else. This video is going to a weird place already and we're two words into this thing. So, hello gamers, I'm Aaron, Senior Design Director, I guess that's his actual title, for Magic. And I'm here with Chris Clay, Game Director. Extraordinaire. The hell is the difference? I'm the Tsar Emperor of Gaming. I'm the Secretarial Engineer of Cardboard. Uh, so I'm here with Chris Clay to talk to you about one of the biggest and best things to happen to Magic the Gathering since, well, since the game itself was invented, Magic the Gathering Arena. Ha <laughs> ha. Wrong. Chandelar was the best thing to happen to it. Just kidding. That game is completely unfair hell. My channel was the best thing to happen to Magic the Gathering since, well, the game itself was invented. Have you seen my dank meme edits? Have you seen them? Like, seriously, guys, have you seen them? Click on my channel name and then click on uh, playlists and then dank meme edits. You will absolutely regret it. That playlist will give your computer or phone Ebola so freaking quick. So, MTG Arena, as I'm sure you're well aware, is our newest video game version of Magic. And although it's still uh, only in open beta, the extent to which all of you have been playing and enjoying it has exceeded our wildest expectations. That is true, they have had a lot of individual games. I actually heavily suspect they're lying about the number. In fact, it's safe to say that our previous set, Guilds of Ravnica, was the most played set in Magic's long history, thanks in a large part to MTG Arena. So in other words, if you count it completely not apples to apples, it was the most played set. Let me just do him a favor and replace that with a stat that actually makes sense. I actually happen to know this for a fact. Guilds of Ravnica was the most heavily attended pre-release event in the history of Magic. Now there's a stat for you. But amid all the fun and games have been a few questions and concerns about how MTG Arena and the traditional tabletop game, aka paper, will coexist going forward. Will one's needs be placed before the other? Will one subsume the other? I, I don't know because I don't know what that word means and neither does anybody else reading this. The funny thing is if you look up the definition, it's actually not even the correct use of that word. Well, we're here to let you know that the best way to describe the relationship between the two platforms as we see it now and into the future is and. So the word and. So big surprise, it's the same old tired narrative of, oh, nothing's replacing anything. Nothing's going to take over for anything, even though it might like, that's not their intention, but let's be honest, it might, you know what I mean? Just like Collected Company might become a $23 card that honestly deserves a ban. 
So then it goes into another section called What and Means. Oh boy, this is sound like a corporate PowerPoint. From the beginning, the plan for MTG Arena was that it would provide an authentic digital magic experience and more, not just because of its amazing graphics and audio effects. Oh, and that that's the end of the sentence. I thought they were going somewhere with that. So not just because of its amazing graphics and audio effects. I make all the sound effects I want when I'm playing paper, so I mean, they got a point there. In fact, I don't remember dropping a cleansing Nova and having MTG Arena go, Shazam, bitch! We wanted to leverage the platform to do things we never could in tabletop on a variety of axes, including speed of games, reduction of non-games, and a plethora of other things we haven't even started work on yet. Okay, so first, the reduction of non-games, they mean just, oops, I got stuck at two land, or I mulled the four, game's over, what a waste of my time. So they appear to have rigged the shuffler, uh, they also rigged who goes first, or so my statistics would strongly suggest, and also they've done the double opening hand thing where it picks the best between them. And mathematically and strategically, it was one of the best ideas ever, but then again, just Let's get it out there that arena's rigged. And for the second part, ooh, things we haven't even started work on yet. Um, they mean instead of paying like Legion or Ultra Pro to make your deck look fancy, you're gonna pay them directly for cosmetics, aka card backs, aka sleeves on arena. I mean, that's one thing they haven't rolled out yet. So what does that mean for tabletop? The short answer is not much, at least when it comes to how much change you should expect to your favorite game. That's funny because you just reworded how a Johnny's Pride Mate works, almost exclusively because of Arena, so that would appear to be a blatant lie. Thanks, guys. We aren't implementing sweeping reform to anything, formats, rules, products, in an attempt to bend the physical toward the digital. Mark Rosewater literally just got done saying that they uh, changed how a card was going to work to make it generate less misclicks on digital platforms. That's why a card says you can only target your opponent's uh, permanents, not your own. And that's the only reason. He said that in an interview a couple months ago. It was 100% because of misclicking people on MTGO, getting pissed off. And then we've got code cards inside of Planeswalker decks and gift packs. So I guess you're lying about that too. So they are literally bending the physical towards the digital in multiple ways and then lying about it. That's wonderful. Thanks, guys. You'll get to keep playing Modern Legacy and Commander... But I love how standard isn't on that list. You'll get to keep playing best of three matches with sideboards. <laughs> uh, let's just say they're pushing a mandatory draft experiment with some of the top WPN locations where they are limiting sideboards. So that once again is 100% not true what they just said. You literally by WPN policy at certain events will not keep playing with sideboards. It's called Quick Draft, look it up, and the WPN program is forcing it on certain LGSs. You'll get to sit down with seven other competitors and booster draft. Um, yeah, I guess. That said, MTG Arena is going to focus on doing some of those things uh, differently or not at all, and adding some things that only it can do. They've already revealed this, it's called Standard Plus, and it's basically a new extended format. Oh, except non-rotating, so it's actually um, a new Frontier format, I guess. I love how they're hinting at it like, like it's a secret and it's already been announced or leaked. Guys, they're really, really good at keeping secrets at Wizards of the Coast. Them and their employees and the contractors are super duper serious about their intellectual property and not leaking things ahead of time. I mean, I don't know how I already know that Nicobolus doesn't succeed or die. He gets trapped on a plane at the end of the third set. Spoiler alert. Well, that employee's fired. So MTG Arena represents a new way of playing the game and we're embracing that. In some ways, Magic has seen and embraced similar new ways of playing with the introduction of formats like Modern and Commander and even other versions of the game like Duels of the Planeswalkers. But in other ways, MTG Arena is breaking new ground as it deviates in ways that can't be easily replicated with traditional cards. And then Chris Clay uh, pops in with one of the elements uh, that the MTG Arena team brings to the table is our willingness to ask why and to challenge conventions that haven't necessarily been questioned in a long time. Like, why the hell did I just ruin the game by mulliganing to four? So the answer was, yeah, why is that? Why, why, why are we accepting the fact that the number one problem with Magic the Gathering is the fact that lands are cards in the deck? Why is it acceptable that 5-10% to 10 of the time the lands in your deck will screw you over and make you lose no matter how good you are at deck building or playing the game? So they rigged the opening hand by invisibly drawing two. I mean, look it up. They do this. They admitted it. So that's cool, but I think we all know they didn't stop there. They affected matchmaking, color matchups, um, this 
mystery thing called an MMR. The shuffler works super great and is super random. Anyway, when we encounter an issue, we are willing to dig in to find out why it exists and whether it's something that digital can address in a way that tabletop can't. Like matches taking way the hell too long. Well, they actually made it worse with Nexus. I don't know if you heard about that. Oh, video coming on that one. Uh, you might think this would uh, put us at odds with those in the TCG design studio. I thought that's where they both work. The part of R&D that makes card sets... I know at least one of them works in that department. Anyway, but in reality, it lets us work uh, problems together and find exciting new solutions to old problems. Like too many white people playing our game. Just kidding. They didn't say that, but I mean, you know, didn't they though? Didn't they? An early example of this was the joint effort around the opening hand approach. Oh God, they're actually mentioning it. They're openly mentioning it. So the opening hand approach we use on MTG Arena in best of one games. Oh, they turned it off for best of three, by the way. You're on your own for best of three. Which you can find out more about here, and they have a, a link directly to the thread discussing it. Wow, that's bold. They usually try to hide the fact that they do this. Uh, having multiple shuffles of the same deck to choose from isn't practical in tabletop, but it's what we settled on after working through lots of math. That's one way to phrase it. Uh, with the folks from the TCG Design Studio, based on all their deep knowledge of mulligans and deck building. Well, that's funny because people are just gaming the system with the priority uh, override system. I just switched my blue-white deck from 23 lands to 24 so that if you divide uh, the deck out, the new priority keep is 3, and it made a huge difference, like an artificially high difference. And I've seen people do the math on that, and yeah, it's broken. You basically just cannot run 23 lands in a deck that would normally require 23 because it's going to artificially prioritize uh, two landers way more than would normally happen naturally. Apparently, they never heard of the concept of rounding. Anyway, they use their deep knowledge of mulligans and deck building. There are places like this where MTG Arena is walking a new path, like letting you play Nexus without having to physically shuffle your cards every three seconds. Oh boy, they're enabling more degenerate crap. Awesome. At least it's doing something about infinite combos. Kind of, almost, sort of. So let's talk about where we're diverging the experiences the most. That's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for them. Draft bots. When Kaladesh... Oh, this is uh, Chris... What's his face? Chris Clay talking. Uh, when Kaladesh released, we also launched the MTG Arena internal alpha, and all that was available was uh, best of one Kaladesh draft, and that was it. Wow, that's awesome. Where you could draft with up to eight real people. Oh, okay. If eight real people weren't available to draft, which is pretty much all the time, how many people work there? Uh, then the remaining seats would be filled with some very primitive bots. Well, X-Mage has them and they're primitive as hell, so yeah. Uh, aside from filling seats, we learned that there was a lot to be gained from having uh, bot drafts. We liked that it allowed new players to learn how to draft without any time pressure. That is huge, because I'm terrible at drafts and I hate the ticking time. Uh, so they could visit tier lists, research cards, and generally take their time, so if they... Uh, have to leave mid-draft, no biggie. I'm pretty damn sure you can't do that, actually. Uh, which also helped experienced players with busy lives. It takes like five minutes to draft a whole... Okay, whatever. Uh, what we have ended up with is a four... Uh, I think they don't mean literally the draft. I think they mean the games, because you can come back to that. Anyway, I know chat drafting is one of my favorite ways to draft... I don't even know what that is. Uh, this is why we've put extra effort into adding bot personalities and continuing to refine the format. Uh, yeah, the ones I drafted against were greedy, unchanging, stubborn dicks. And they would not jump off the color no matter how many I pulled. So we all split the colors and we all suffered because of it, except I actually went on to play a real game. So thanks, bots, for grabbing all the good gruel cards. Uh, let's see, this is why we put extra bot personas, okay, great. Uh, it will never replace the unique experience of an eight-person pod, but we def uh, but we believe it definitely stands on its own. Yeah, they're not wrong there, and Aaron Forsythe says, uh, this has been a fun problem to dig into. How do you make a table full of AI opponents provide a good experience? Well, they didn't, so you guys failed. Uh, but one with enough variability that it doesn't become predictable. Uh, we're tackling it in a bunch of ways, personalities for the bots, more accurate pick orders using external data, and some good old intuition. 
Okay, if you say so. At the end of the day, the experience of drafting at your own pace, up to and including across multiple login sessions, make all this work worth it. Uh, I've been having a blast with it, both the internal work and the end product. Uh, which isn't to say it's perfect, just like me reading this, which is going terribly, and we keep iterating on it with the MTG Arena folks every chance we get. So I do like that it was intentional that they let you take as long as you want for a pick. That's just amazing, because the high pressure thing, I'm bad enough at draft already, and as a, like kind of a new draft person, I've literally only drafted like eight times ever in my entire life. Twice in paper, like two times on X-Mage, and maybe it's not even eight. <laughs> Yeah, I don't like the whole, oh, and you've only got 60 seconds. Like, that is just so obnoxious. So then they talk about best of three versus best of one. So uh, Chris says, for almost all of Magic's history, best of three with sideboarding has been the go-to solution for competitive play, and it survived the test of time due to its strategic depth and competitive balance. And I agree 100%, the sideboard is how you win games, and intelligent sideboard decisions are part of the game, just as much as building your own deck is a part of the game. That's why I hate net deckers, among a hundred other reasons. With the upcoming Mythic Invitational, we're working on an alternative format that has multiple games per round, but doesn't include sideboarding. Okay, that sounds awful. What the hell is the point of that? Uh, as with any other time we've bucked tradition, we're heading down this path for what we believe are compelling reasons. Oh, hit me with them. Uh, we don't want competitive matches to be decided in a single game, but we also believe that having multiple matches with a variety of decks... Oh, I know where they're going with this. They already announced this, too. Uh, will provide an exciting new play experience. So what they're going to do is make you submit multiple decks and it will randomly pick what deck you're playing with, which sounds like the worst thing I've ever heard of. We know that this new format will increase the overall possibility space to be solved with each set. No, you're actually adding complexity and variance. So it's actually the opposite. And it will allow those watching to directly integrate what they've seen at the highest level of play into how they play MTG Arena. I'm sure that was another vague shot at NetDeckers and how they're ruining the game. Whatever. They are. It's true. They're just being way too polite about it. Um, it also removes the huge barrier to entry from competitive play. Yeah, because everybody just net decks and copies what everybody else is doing. And on MTG Arena, we want as many people participating in the process and engaging in the events as we can muster. Uh, no, you're only inviting the top eight, actually, out of like a million, maybe. Uh, sideboarding solves many problems, but it does so with the addition of a process that is challenging to understand and master. Um, no, it pretty much goes hand in hand with building the deck. I build the sideboard simultaneously. I say, okay, if I put this in, the deck can't do this. So in case my opponent is doing this, I'm going to throw this in the sideboard and we're going to throw in exactly this many. It's, it's part of the game. It's part of the decisions. It's part of the deck building. I guess this whole paragraph was stupid net deckers copy a deck and then they don't know what they're doing so they don't know how to sideboard correctly so we're getting rid of sideboarding. Wow, that is unbelievable. I don't know if you guys have seen some stupid clueless net decker who thinks that they're hot shit because they uh, copied somebody else's deck from the internet and are playing it but they don't know how to make mulligan decisions or what cards to play in what order either. So taking away the sideboard from them, they're still going to find a way to stick a fork in an outlet, trust me. They're taking a shortcut, they're not good enough to play the game, and just ignore them. That's my opinion. We didn't start with the goal of creating this new format we're calling Arena Standard for competitive play in MTG Arena. That's seriously what you named it. Uh, but the closed and open betas have led us to where we're at today. Uh, from the start, we wanted to have MTG Arena be a place for fast, fun magic. Yeah, that's why I don't want to play against the same damn deck three times in a row. That's that's just terrible. That's the worst thing ever. Oh, you don't want matches to be decided by one game because that's not fair and doesn't represent anything? Well, who cares? I don't want to play against the same deck three times in a row. I just don't. Nobody does. In fact, I recall people complaining about that. You want to pull that classic crap because I do prefer to play that way at FNM? Simple. Go to MTGO. So they wanted uh, it to be a place for fast, fun magic and in creating a client that can support that we found that the vast majority of our players, what the hell was that supposed to mean? Ended up playing primarily best of one games. That was almost a sentence in English. Uh, there are many reasons people gravitate towards best of one, but in the end it all comes down to the length of a match. Told ya, and not wanting to play the same deck three times in a row. Um, all other aspects uh, being equal, it's much easier to commit to a match that is going to average out to roughly six minutes of playtime. 
clearly they're not in the Diamond League playing against Teferi, uh, then it is to sign or then it is to sign up for a match that is going to be closer to three times that amount. Uh, on the far end, over 99% of best of one matches are completed in under 18 minutes. I do not believe that for a second based on my own personal experience. I'd say maybe a third of them go over 20 minutes. So in best of three matches, that isn't true until just under an hour. It is true that on average, games will be longer once people have sideboarded because they've got answers and they're going to drag the game out to more turns. That is absolutely a fact. So they are spot on with that one. Um, this in no way means that we want to abandon best of three play on MTG Arena, but it has us looking for ways we can tailor competitive play to better match how most people play MTG Arena. I've got an idea. Unless somebody's actively clicking or doing something, cut the timer by 66%. Make it one third shorter. I am so sick of taking 20 minutes instead of six minutes to play a game because the other person is watching Netflix while cooking dinner. Slow players are the worst thing in arena right now, except for repetitive control garbage decks, and that's just the standard meta. So if they really want to do something about it, force people to either time out from the game three times faster, so force their attention, or come up with a different idea. I mean, that's what immediately comes to my mind, but who knows? So as with many parts of MTG Arena development, this is an ongoing process and will continue to evolve how it's working with our partners within Wizards and with our players. Do they mean co-workers? What the hell is partners within Wizards mean? They both work for Wizards of the Coast. Well, that actually was Chris Clay talking. Maybe he doesn't work directly for them, or he's like on just the arena team and he was brought in from like, you know, Valve or something. That's where a lot of the project managers and devs are from or like other companies. But they still work for Wizards. Anyway, Aaron Forsyth says an important ingredient to having our esports leagues. Ooh and events be compelling for the rest of the MTG Arena playing audience is to have it mirror as closely as possible the experience that they themselves, that or that they have themselves, that's a weird way to phrase it as well, uh, when they play the game. Sideboarding does not do that. Yes, it does. It absolutely does. I can't imagine how it does not do that. It's more accurate to FNM, it's more accurate to the history of magic, it's more accurate to paper, it's more accurate to deck building, He's like collected company is bad levels of wrong right now. Making an instant speed. What an idiot. So get this. Because we already know they're doing this, they already announced it. Sideboarding does not do that. But switching decks entirely does. You literally aren't allowed to switch decks in any tournament ever at all. How the actual hell is that more accurate to real life or more accurate to the playing audience or whatever the hell they just said? Nobody does that. It's actually a violation of the rules of magic. Here, let me translate this from his completely BS lies to actual reality. We want people to buy more cards, buy more packs and open more wild cards. So we're going to force you to build two really good decks instead of one. So cut the crap and that's what you're left with as far as logic. So their ridiculous explanation is, I know that I'll swap to a new deck frequently on the constructed ladder. I won't. I know what wins. I'm going to play up against the same two damn decks, Red Rush and Blue White Control anyway. So, of course, I'm going to play what wins against those. So, especially if I start losing. See, that's where the logic already self-destructs. If you start losing, you're not going to go back to the deck that you lost with. So, forcing people to artificially switch decks for no reason is not true to what you would do. Once you get into the top ranks of, like, Gold, Platinum, Diamond, Mythic... You're going to play the same deck over and over and over whether you want to or not. We certainly appreciate that no one wants a round of a premiere event to be just a single game and swapping decks will allow for a diverse, interesting experience. Yes, forcing you to play a deck you didn't want to play with and to build two decks and hope that one of them's a good matchup and, and you win both games, it's, that is really stupid. We aren't even mandating that the decks actually be different? What the hell? So you just build the same deck twice and pretend you're swapping it? Are you kidding me? So if you, quote, break the format, we'll let you play your deck all event long. What the actual hell was the point of this then? They already said at the Mythic Championship, there's going to be two different decks, as they put it, 
and the deck will be randomly selected when you start the game. So now you can just keep it consistent, build the best deck that can be built in standard twice, and just run that completely defeating the entire purpose of it. Amazing. I have never seen this level of stupidity, at least recently, in anything Wizards has said. This is like they've reached a new level. Will the no sideboarding metagame be different from the traditional ones we're all used to? We certainly hope so. As I said before, MTG Arena is meant to be an additional way to play, and magic is at its best when each experience is different in its own way with new puzzles to solve. So in other words, you're going to ban Nexus, but only on uh, Arena. Cool, do it. Um, I look forward to all the additional content that cracking the no sideboarding metagame will add to the already robust traditional metagame content out there, which is just going to be play your deck twice and clone it. I mean, that's what I'm going to tell everybody. I've seen some really cool lists pop up already, and we're just getting started. Yes, build Teferi Turbo Fog, and then like Teferi Turbo Mill. Wow, groundbreaking, you guys. What an amazing evolution of the standard meta. So then they hint at some more things without outright saying them. Uh, our desires for different decks and metagames has led the TCG Design Studio to start exploring how to support all forms of play with the cards we put in our sets. We think that more cards like Knights of Autumn, or Knight of Autumn, Ravager Worm, and Bedevil should lower the number of, quote, unwinnable matchups in Arena Standard. Or ban Nexus and Teferi, you dumbasses. Meanwhile, we'll continue to make traditional sideboard cards like Cinder Vines, Unmoored Ego, and Citywide Bust that can find homes in tabletop sideboards. So in other words, they're modifying how the entire set and all of Magic is designed to favor Arena, which is what they just said they're not doing, but here's an example of them doing it. Like, they literally just said, Knight of Autumn, Ravager Worm, and Bedevil were designed for Arena. Well, that's fantastic. Design doesn't have the decades of iteration with Arena Standard as it does with tabletop sideboarding version, so there will be some learnings as we go. So in other words, less slots in future products will be taken up by standard sideboard cards, which will ruin FNM. Just in case something goes haywire, I'll mention it here that we can maintain separate banned lists for the two versions of Standard. I told you, they're going to ban Nexus of Fate from Arena. They're going to do it. They're going to have an Arena-only uh, banned list. Let me reread this in case you didn't get it. Just in case something goes haywire, I'll mention it here that we can maintain separate banned lists for the two versions of a standard, and MTG Arena will be able to enforce the proper list based on which mode you are enjoying. That's a BS way of saying it's going to be an arena-only ban list. I mean, they're not going to have a best-of-one ban list with a with a sideboarding ban list when the second format they just invented doesn't have sideboarding. So yeah, eliminating sideboarding from arena, the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life, and I can't wait for them to walk it back. This is just beyond idiotic. So as always, we'll be carefully monitoring the metagame data to make sure the experience we're hoping for is actually the one you get. Um, yeah, have you seen the number of people playing Arena and the number of pissed off people complaining about it online? Do you have a statistic for that? How many people have literally came to the forums for MTG Arena and said, I am not going to play Arena anymore until you get rid of this Teferi trash? I've seen a dozen or so myself personally, and I never go on the forums pretty much. Put that little statistic in your system and see what it spits out. Oh, a bad nexus. Okay. So this video is already way the hell too long. Um, I'm sick of listening to these blowhards talk out their ass and lie to people. So um, yeah, I just wanted to clear up this ridiculous, just false propaganda BS that they put out. So what do you think? This new arena standard, which is like best of three, but doesn't have sideboarding. Like if I'm playing best of three, I'm damn well using a sideboard. That's if I'm going to waste my time. I'm going to bring sideboarding into it because I'm really good at building a sideboard and making sideboarding decisions, and it lets me win games. So am I the only one here? Am I the outlier, or do you guys completely agree? I'd love to hear about it down in the comments. Which, by the way, if you can't see any of, it's because all comments on all videos from all people on my entire channel are held for review. Automatically. If you can't see any, it means I didn't read them and approve them yet, because I'm probably sleeping. I'm getting really sick of explaining this. So it's not a conspiracy theory, it's not because you're banned, and it's not because of aliens. It's because I'm sleeping. Or playing Oblivion. Actually, I was playing Fortune Street for four hours last night, and the comments were really piling up. So anyway, just want to let you know uh, what these guys are planning, and what's coming up for the future of Arena, and the re 
ridiculously, provably false and contradictory statements that they've been uh, putting in this article. So don't believe 100% of it at face value. Thanks for watching, and I will see you guys next video.